Biobalance HealthCast, episode 261, New Treatment for Endometriosis. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. This week we're going to be talking about a health issue for women that is very painful, very emotionally disturbing, very difficult to resolve. Women are frustrated when they have it, they're in pain when they have it, it interferes with their fertility and their ability to have children when they want, but it's also throughout a very painful thing that they experience and it's called endometriosis. And when we began to do the research to talk about this on our our health cast, I had to confess utter and complete ignorance. I've heard the term, I've talked to women who've suffered from it, and they've described a little bit of some things that were done to them, but I don't have a clue what endometriosis is, why you have it, what it looks like, why it's so painful. So my, my expectation today is that for those of us in the audience who don't know what women know, you can, <laughs> you can know. talk us through uh, the information we need to have about mm-hmm. endometriosis and its treatments. Just like you were a woman in my office sitting exactly. there across from if my I desk. If I were a truly sensitive human be- a female. <laughs> yes. So endometriosis is hard to describe, and that's probably why you haven't gotten a handle on it before. It is, you. I have to make a picture to describe it. So... It is implants of tissue, tissue meaning like a little, it looks like a little berry that's on the inside of your abdomen, not the inside of the uterus, inside of your abdomen, that bleeds every month when young women have cycles. So it is responsive to the same hormones as the tissue inside the uterus. So usually estrogen goes up progesterone goes up they both fall and then that causes a period and the period is the lining of the womb shedding shedding so the tissue that's inside their abdomen with the women that have this is just like the tissue that's inside their uterus it's just in the wrong place and being in the wrong place with this is everything so it's it actually bleeds inside the woman's abdomen when they're having a period. So it fills so the it, abdomen with painful fluid. Painful fluid. It can be pink or clear. I've done lots of, I mean, thousands of laparoscopes where somebody had endometriosis. So you look in and you see this pretty little uterus and then you see all these like black berries or dark red berries that are implanted all over the lining of the uterus. And the lining of the uterus looks like... Um, like cellophane. It's very smooth. I mean, excuse me, the lining of the pelvis is very smooth. It covers the uterus, it covers the ovaries, covers everything. And it's supposed to protect you from having your bowels stick to the wall of the pelvis So you're, and your bowels in there right next to your ovaries. So what happens is in the, in the lifetime of endometriosis is first, these little implants bleed. They cause pain. If nothing is done, they bleed. They, there's more of them. They multiply, basically. And then they start scarring to things that are next to them. Sometimes they scar the, the uh, tubes shut. Sometimes they scar... So, ovaries or fallopian? The fallopian tubes. Okay. And then sometimes they scar over the ovary. Sometimes they make a big cyst filled with old blood, and, and they rupture and cause an emergency. We have to go in and sometimes take the ovary out. And worse, sometimes they actually scar to the bowel. So that's when it becomes a chronic pain. The pain is episo- episodic. It comes and goes with a period at first. Then it becomes just pelvic pain all the time. You walk, you turn a certain way, it pulls because now you've got these, they look like cobwebs, but they're very strong. And it goes from the endometriosis implant to your bowel and to the sidewall of your pelvis. So anytime you move, you can easily feel this. It gets so bad that it hurts to walk. So... And, and it hurts when you have a bowel movement or just hurts it does, all the time? It often hurts when you have a bowel movement because the, the uterus can be 
stuck like glue. It acts like glue. Uh -huh. it sticks to the uh, sigmoid colon that comes behind the uterus. It can stick to your bladder. It can even be implanted inside the bladder and uh, women urinate blood. Oh, you wow. can. It can go through the wall of the pelvis. That's gotta be excuse scary. me of the of the colon, and you can you can have blood in your stool. So it it is not cancer, but it just makes you so miserable and infertile. It's the biggest reason for us taking ovaries, which you always take the uterus if you take ovaries. So taking the ovaries out of young women. The process of treatment, because we have a new treatment for this uh, now that has been discovered in, in uh, a research study in Europe. But the treatment has always been first to starve the implants. They're fed by estrogen and progesterone in that cycle that we go through every month. So those little implants grow when these hormones go up and down. So we starve them. By putting a woman on birth control pills, it drops their estrogen level very low. And so it makes these implants, in the best of worlds, d just dry up. When it works the way you want it to. Right. When yeah. it works properly, and it doesn't work properly for everybody, right. and some pe people can't take the pill, it makes them sick, or they have terrible side effects to it, which preclude us using that. So this is something that we use first, and we don't let patients have periods. We don't let women have periods. We just keep them on the birth control pill all the time and keep them from bleeding, and if they don't bleed, they don't have pain. Well, and I thought the way the birth control pills operated was to regulate the period so that every 27 days or 28 days you would you would know and be able to predict I'm going to start on the 13th of next month because you're taking the birth control pill. Right. Birth there control are different pill, ones that work a different way or you just, We use the, the pill a different way for different this. Way. Okay. So normally you have 3 weeks of hormone like they have a little bit of estrogen, a little bit of progestin in them mm -hmm. and they suppress the stimulation from your brain, we've talked about FSH and LH, they shut FSH and LH down so that there's no stimulation to the to the ovaries, decreases your own estrogen and testosterone level, and will thin out the lining of the uterus, but also thin out the implants. Okay. So, the, so we do it, most of the time you have three weeks on, one week off, you bleed during the week off, we don't give them the week off. Okay. So we just give them low-dose birth control pills all the time. And does this cause any long-term harm then to the womb or the uterus if you're not bleeding periodically to clean that system out? In general, the lining doesn't grow inside the uterus. Okay. It doesn't grow outside the uterus where the implants are. Mm -hmm. So there's there's no harm to it. Okay. It just keeps you it's keeps you from having it just puts it in a stasis. Right, it's like menopause. Yeah, it's like it's almost like menopause. There are some other differences that are Do they have physiologic. The mood swings and stuff. No, the mood swings come with your hormones going up and down. Okay. So no mood swings, usually no migraines from up and down hormones. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, their pelvis doesn't hurt They're all not the time. Not in pain all the time. Right. Right. So if that works, great. We so leave so them on like birth control girls. pills. We're talking about young girls. I mean, this and, can start so at thirteen. In Tennessee, they can get married at thirteen if they're pregnant. Without their parents' permission, something I learned. That's a week. yeah. That's a piece of information. Uh, <laughs> I didn't need to. But, I guess I but, did. So fertility becomes a question for some women as they grow older and want to to have babies. Mm -hmm. So then, so what? if the pill works, then we take them off the pill and say get pregnant right away. Quickly. Because before the <laughs> endometriosis, before you wake up again, and come back. Hurt. That's right, and start to bleed. Okay. So what when? When they bleed inside, they, they cause inflammation. They make even more estrogen, so that's why people get bloated and swollen from mm -hmm. it. There's estrogens just swimming in estrogen in there. And uh, they also, besides being in pain, they cause the scarring. So that can cause you to be infertile, okay? So you can't get pregnant. So the best way to do this is shut that whole thing down. Pills do it. If they don't do it, they go next to Lupron. I'll get I'll get to fertility after okay. this, but they go, next go to Lupron and Lupron is a shot that shot. you take for six months at a time, and it does put you in menopause. And the downside of it is terrible hot flashes, and terrible dry vagina, and I mean it's it's pelvis saving, but so it has a for a while it makes your body that of an old lady, but it makes you like you're old. Yeah. 
and which it, without hormones and that is not pleasant i mean i've taken i've had endometriosis that's why i had my um hysterectomy so when i was 47 i should have had it when i was 37. so you explain this so, to young adult women you say this is going to make you have a dry vagina this mm-hmm. is going to you know shut your system but down. It, but they're in so much pain right they're so happy to be out of pain and i was in my first in my first six months of this, it really solved the pain problem, but I almost stripped down to nothing on a bus in Aspen because I was having hot flashes and it was like two below. So, I mean, it makes you feel... I may have seen that movie on a bus in Aspen. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. Anyway, we were, you know, yeah. it was one of those things where it makes you so hot that you, you feel like taking your clothes off. Not that you would. So, yeah. okay. rolling in the snow. Anyway, so that's that's... Usually we'll give somebody Lupron and then tell them to get pregnant. If they don't get pregnant and these come back, we do a second course. We usually don't do a third course. I did. Um, and I had osteopenia because of this. When I was 42, they found that my bones were very thin because of the Lupron. So it's get the hormones. Right. To keep your bones. Right. Because so it's not without risk for you to take Lupron. So, but it keeps the pain away for a certain period of time for you to get pregnant. Third thing, and it can come anywhere in this. You could be on pills, and then the pain comes back, and your doctor says, "Look, it's so bad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a surgery. I'm gonna do a laparoscope." So you reach a point where you know you're not gonna be able to get pregnant. Well, this is before that. We do a laparoscope to to burn out the the implants if they don't respond to any of these things. Okay. We do a minor procedure. We look in the pelvis. We can tell if the if the. Uh, Tubes are open. We can tell if the implants are really bad. We can tell if the ovaries are still functioning or if they're buried in in, um, in kind of a velamentous cover like from the scar tissue. So we can tell by looking. We go in and use a laser and burn out these implants, but there's always more that come up. That gives them a short period of time to get pregnant or a short period of time to decide if they want a hysterectomy. I've done, when you talk to patients, you give them the options. I've done maybe six laparoscopes on one person over the years who started this when she was 18. And then finally, the final answer to this is hysterectomy. So if you, we can't get rid of it, nothing is working. So now we go to hysterectomy and you have to take the ovaries out because it's the ovaries that are cycling and giving you this way up estrogen, way down, way up, way down, which causes the bleeding in the pelvis. Kind of like Star Wars video on the arcades they yeah. just keep killing all the aliens and they just keep growing and coming yeah. back and it wasn't as much fun uh, it was it not was with the pain plus it was so it was so it was horrible to have to tell people that you know you lasered everything but it was so severe it may come back in six months yeah you know so it's a very difficult thing to manage so if in that six month window a woman gets pregnant what happens then with the endometriosis it goes dormant Okay. It so, just goes so dormant. It doesn't impact their ability to, to carry a child to term and have the baby if they no. can get pregnant. If they can get pregnant. Okay. It may cause some pain because the scar tissue that it formed, if it attached to the uterus, and the uterus goes from being this big to that big, it pulls on those attachments and it hurts. So it may cause pain, mm. but it doesn't truly affect the pregnancy. So that's our hope. Yeah. We're usually doing this not just for pain, but for preserving fertility. And then when we get somebody to preserve their fertility and get them pregnant, then we're ecstatic. We have them, we ask them to breastfeed because that usually keeps it away because during breastfeeding, all you have is progesterone, no estrogen, no testosterone, no nothing. It's just a very dry feel, kind of like you're in menopause again. Mm-hmm. And when breastfeeding's over, then we put them right back on the pill if they want to have another child. If they don't, then they've got a choice. They can go on nothing and see what happens, or they can go on Lupron again, or they can, you know, they can go through this right. whole process. Go right through the options. Yeah. In my case, I didn't want to have a hysterectomy because I kept thinking, hoping beyond hope that I'd have a second child. Right. And in the meantime, I had an ectopic pregnancy because I was scarred. An ectopic means means the baby the baby forms in your tube instead of so in the in, in, in the uterus, yeah. and so it was during an in vitro or an in vitro fertilization, and and because of the endometriosis and the scarring that was there, it caused the it caused it to be ectopic, and twist up, and as it grew, it exploded, right. and so I had to have that tube out. And was that an emergency surgery? Yeah, that was an emergency surgery, and then it was filled with endometriosis. I just had, I had endometriosis and 
the ectopic pregnancy. So it could just take out one tube mm -hmm. and still leave you with the hope that the other one would work. Yeah, but it never looks that good. When you've got endometriosis, yeah. it scars the tube, twists it, makes it kind of not look good most of the time. And so it didn't look that good. I looked at my own pictures. So, you know, they we take pictures during the surgery. You would. Yeah, well, everybody does. I show it to them. Yeah. I mean, a picture's worth a thousand words. <laughs> really? I'm like, see, this tube, if I just say your tube's your tube scarred, they go, what does that mean? If I show them, they go, oh, I can't get the egg to the uterus. So, so we've got a problem. So there are other infertility surgeries you can go to in vitro fertilization, like I did. Didn't work for me, but it works for many people. So there are other ways to get around it. But we now have another tool in our toolbox. They've done research on endometriosis, and there's been tons of different ways we've thought to get rid of endometriosis. I invested in one because it sounded right, and it would have been if endometriosis all had the same genetics, but they don't. So we were looking at a genetic way to, um, to kill them, an immu immune way to kill them. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't work. So now they found that because of the estrogen feeding the implants, and the implants making more estrogen. If we use Arimidex, which is an aromatase inhibitor with these patients, they don't go through menopause. It decreases their estrogen, but they don't go through menopause. They don't, it decreases the implants. They, they burn or kind of look like little burn marks. They shrink and go away. And we can keep them on this. It does lower their estrogen level, but in young people, they still make enough that they're not gonna get osteoporosis. <coughs> And it actually works on the implant itself. Not ju it doesn't require the whole body to be, be lacking all estrogen. So, so it's an easier, better treatment. We use it with testosterone often. So it's a specific target drug right. for the implants. Right, because the implants are taking <coughs> testosterone and other adrenal hormones and making estrogen out of them. It blocks that. It blocks that, and so then the other estrogen that your body makes is still available for the other parts of your it's body. It's a lower level. It will decrease your, your estrogen, but it's not going to be so low that you'll be in menopause. Okay. So your body still makes enough estrogen. It doesn't work the same way as birth control pills. It's working at the target, which is the uh, endometriotic implant. Mm -hmm. So it does work there, and they've, they always say, well, in this research, watch out, don't, you know. But we use Arimidex for other things. We use it to prevent breast cancer. We use it to treat breast cancer. We use it for men to get rid of gynecomastia, which is, uh, I call them man breasts. Mm -hmm male breasts, and we use it uh, with testosterone when somebody has the genetics for conversion. They just make a lot of estrogen out of their testosterone, which decreases our ability to make them better. So some individuals' bodies take testosterone and convert it into estrogen. Yes. And those, the, I would say, but this does not say this in the study, my experience says that if you've had endometriosis, in the past, and that's why I asked that question, that you're more likely to convert testosterone into estrogen because that's what feeds endometriosis. So you ask so, that question on the medical interview with a woman when she comes in. Right. And then I know, oh, I might have to use Arimidex with her. Right. It isn't a surprise. Yes. So that helps me. But in the case of endometriosis, it's very possible, had this been known, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have had to have a hysterectomy. And I wouldn't, wouldn't have, have had to have my ovaries pain. out. And I wouldn't have had pain. The pain was really bad for 10 years. Debil debilitating long-term pain is one of the most crippling things that you can experience. It interferes with your mood. It interferes with Oh, and you thinking. never have sex when you have pain in your pelvis. It's, it's like, forget it because it just hurts too much. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, so so it's it, it damages families, it damages everything, and you can't be in a good mood, even though I could be in a good mood in the office, I wasn't at, in a good mood at home. Yeah, turn you on You know, I could turn on my professional hat and just deny that I was in pain, go to surgery, see patients, deliver babies, and then go home and just be miserable. See, I think automatically, you think in terms of medicine, I think in terms of counseling, and when you're telling me this, that somebody who was experiencing this wouldn't want to have sex, I would be listening to couples talk about, she never wants to have sex. She doesn't love me anymore. She always says it's painful. I think that's an excuse because I can't feel your pain. Mm -hmm. Bill Clinton perhaps could, but I, I can't. <laughs> uh, and so 
it's not a visible marker. It's like depression, uh -huh. and we don't see it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were limping around on a crutch or something, or you had a bloody toe that you just cut, you get some sympathy and some empathy. Otherwise, my own needs are likely to be intrusive and cause me to be less respectful of your pain or your reality, and that creates a dynamic in the relationship around sex where there are troubles. That's why I take pictures in the laparoscope. Yeah, or I absolutely. Took, when I was doing surgery, Here, look at this. <laughs> I would say, I would say to the to because yeah. I go out and talk to the husband. I don't talk to the wife. She's under anesthesia and she's waking up right. and she'll never remember a thing. Right. So I talk to the husband or the or the partner and I say, "Here's her pelvis. I cut, you know, before and after. I cut all of these." you know, adhesions, and here are these implants, and they bleed every month, and they hurt. Look at these. This is why she has pain with intercourse. Mm -hmm. This is why she doesn't want to have intercourse. Now, she's going to have a ki kind of a um, period of time where she'll be better, but it's possible that this will come back. So you have to believe that she doesn't want to have intercourse because she's in pain. Now, there are other reasons. It's like sticking your finger in a hornet's nest, but all the hornets are stinging her, not you. Right. That's right. Uh, and you have to have some compassion for that and some sense. Right. I think, and there's no real way to tell from the man's standpoint or from mine when I'm examining her, right. unless it's it's a completely scarred up pelvis that they have endometriosis. Yeah. So how would you know that it's there? Right. And that's something that, you know, a woman's not going to go, oh, I have. I mean, we rarely want to say that we're in pain. Yes. So it seems like we're just rejecting. Yes. The, the man. Now, if you have, you can have pain from other things and you right. can have pain from infections or you can have pain. I mean, there's other reasons, but this is a progressively worsening pain with intercourse. Yeah. And this is something that is much worse right before the period than it is and right. right during and during the period than it is after. And that old standby that everybody said, well, have sex during a period. It's it's easier, it's better, it doesn't hurt so much. That does not work with people with endometriosis. Yeah. That makes it much worse. So wow. that's not something that helps. But you always have to rule as a physician when someone comes to you before you've ever looked in their pelvis. or You have to listen for the history, the story. And the story is so similar Which for everybody. Which is why everybody. you need to be able to spend time with people. Right. You have to talk to them. There is no test besides looking inside their belly in the operating room under anesthesia where you can actually see endometriosis. We can't do a CAT scan. We can't do an MRI unless it's become a huge mass, but there's nothing where we can see it yes. unless we operate. So so sometimes I'd operate just to diagnose it and make sure it wasn't bowel problems or, right. or something, something else. else. So you diagnose and treat at the first surgery so you know what they have. So, so two takeaway messages then for our audience. One is the the painfulness of endometriosis and the need for information and sensitivity on the part of men in relationships with women to have it. And the other is there is a medicine now that offers a great deal of hope to avoid the pain, maintain the fertility, and not have all of these issues. And it's it's a medicine that's been around for a while. They're just using it for a different reason, mm -hmm. and that is a Remedex. And you can find the article in the um in the journal, Steroids in Neuroendocrine Immunology and Therapy for Rheumatic Disease. That's you a mouthful. You can probably get that at Quick Trip, but uh, <laughs> delivered there on a monthly basis. Yeah, it's, I mean, you can. Right it's next a, to the cigarettes. It's in 2014, and uh, you could you could either look up um, endometriosis and, and rheumatology. I think that would probably be your best keywords if you want to read more about it. Um, but it's, it's really a groundbreaking kind of article. And I'm really pleased to be telling you about it because it gives us another tool, another another way to make women avoid having a hysterectomy. And with a lot less pain in their lives. Yes, and a lot less pain. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.